Yeah, let's, that's right. Like they can see that we're also like anxious about hitting record and going. Yeah, help you help you raise your personal bar. Yeah, I've got birds on my own. Sound? But... <clears throat> you ready to go? We got this. Take a sip of water, Simon. Oh it's on the checklist. God. That's what I've done already like you? five times. Yeah, that's why we just got to go for it. There's nothing to be nervous about. I if mean, it we, goes catastrophically we, wrong, we can just not release it. But we and we're already it. live. We're already live. Like, yeah, it's we've probably... been live for 11 minutes so far. Welcome to the Navbar, a new podcast where we will help you navigate all of the new web development things and give you some tips and tricks to help raise the bar of your own content creation. My name is John Myers. I'm a developer advocate from Superbase. And I am Simon Vrashley Otis, aka Simon Swiss. I'm a front-end developer, designer, content creator, currently working at ThinkMill in Sydney. Awesome. All right, Simon, let's do this. So our main menu item today is how to record a good video. So both Simon and I have been spending a significant amount of time uh, creating video content over the past year or so, uh, and we thought this would be a really interesting topic to help kickstart our podcast. Yeah, for sure. And I couldn't think of anyone better than you to share this like sort of podcast. We, we've we both spent a lot of time doing videos in the last year. Uh, we have pretty fancy setups. But on that topic, I think we should stick to the more like philosophical approach. Uh, just try to talk about what it takes to record a good video, not which mic, which lights we're using. We can do another episode on that. On that. But yeah, just talk about uh, little tips and techniques and just more... Uh, we can talk about gear, but without going into specific recommendation, just like what it takes overall to make good videos. How does that sound? Yeah, for sure. That sounds excellent. Nice. Uh, and yeah, likewise, I can't think of anyone better to record this podcast Ooh. with than you uh, for all of those reasons, but the even more important reason that we're both here in Australia, which is very convenient that we're actually in the same time zone. Uh, everyone else in, in North America and Europe uh, just used to people being online at the same time. But it uh, turns out it's it's a little challenging to do things like this synchronously, especially every week. Uh, yeah, totally, man. So it's it's lovely to have you. Likewise, likewise. I think it's uh, a luxury for us living in Australia to be able, it's uh, 11 in the morning now, to be able to record that. I've every single appearance on any podcast or live stream or anything I've done was at 5 a.m. or midnight or something even more ridiculous. So I think uh, to make it sustainable and enjoyable for both of us, it's kind of nice to be able to do this in our time zone. Uh, the latency and everything is probably also better. And what I hope is eventually, because you might not know this, but we're streaming this live, just the recording experience of us going through the recording, uh, get uh, some sort of audience, local audience that usually wakes up and sees on Twitter that they missed out the really cool stream with all these people because it's always in the middle of the night. Yeah. And uh, hopefully I'm a little bit more awake than I usually am when I feature on other podcasts. And so I'll be much more articulate than I usually am. Uh, we both yeah, have so, coffees too. Yeah, that's right. That is that is the secret to, uh, <laughs> to good podcasts is lots of coffee. So the first point that we wanted to talk about here is making uh, clear and concise videos. Um, so making sure that uh, your topic is well-defined. So thinking through like, what what do I actually want this video to be about rather than just uh, you know, waffling on, like you can do that in a live stream or even a podcast like this. Uh, but if you're going to be creating this kind of, um, YouTube tutorial style video, uh, keeping things super well-defined and really thinking about beforehand, what, what are the, the key points that you actually want to get out of this? Um, another really beneficial thing, um, I think that both of us really like coming from kind of the egghead style of, of creating courses, uh, is skipping long intros. So we have actually had yep. a little bit of a long intro here, uh, <laughs> bouncing back and forth. But one of our ideas for this podcast was to try and get um, the valuable content kind of as early as possible. So people who just want that question answered can just listen to that part. Uh, and then we can do the more kind of casual stuff at the end. Um, and so in videos as well, skipping that that long content where you're just kind of, um, you know, saying, I'm John and this is my dog and here we are in this place and, and this is my my backstory, uh, just jumping straight to uh, the bit that people find valuable. Um, yep. And then, yeah, kind of in that same vein, avoiding kind of uh, side quests and rabbit holes and uh, going on long tangents. Uh, if they're tangents that allow you to uh, to kind of further clarify the topic that you're trying to to get across, and that's fine. Um, but trying to not kind of go too far uh, off topic, I guess. 
Nice, nice. Yeah, I, I super agree with, and I think this is the the egghead school that kind of taught us this. The everything like the intro and the context is already on the page. If someone watches a video, there's a title and a description, and they maybe have done a, a search on Google and it came up with this, so they already know they're going to watch. Uh, specific topic. So even something like, hey, today we're going to build this with this framework. Technically, uh, I know I actually make the mistake and do it all the time, but you could almost skip that part because it's already in the meta description and the context around the video. And chances are people click on the video to see the thing they know you're going to talk about. So yeah, try to jump straight to the point. Uh, I find myself sometimes it feels a bit rude to just, just try straight in without uh, introducing yourself, but you get used to it and I myself prefer if I watch someone's video, if it goes straight into the topic, because I know who they are and this is why I'm watching the video, I guess. I have this little wire here and ah. the more I talk, the more I gesticulate. Uh, yeah, you're gesticulating <laughs> I, too aggressively yeah. and you're knocking your headphones out. I think I told uh, last week I told you I will definitely knock this thing either off the socket here or off my face and it happened. This is great. All so right. uh, thanks for that. Uh, the second point I wanted to cover is... Uh, how to make your videos engaging and entertaining, which I think it's it's critical. Like there's a lot of content creators out there and a lot of quality content. And one way to stand out or make it more easy to learn and consume your content is to make it authentic and bring your own personality and bring your energy. One thing that uh, is important to note is um, video, and you can see right now, this is just the top part of my body. You can't really see what my legs look like, see just the whole body language. Uh, the whole um, communication that we lose through the video, we kind of just have this face and the voice in our ears and we kind of have to compensate for that. So I don't want to say get over the top and overdo yourself, but definitely let your own personality shine and don't try to hold back and try to uh, stick to some sort of delivery. Just be who you are, who if you are at a meetup or at a somewhere with your friends, just be that person and uh, almost accentuate it a bit without being obnoxious, but just try to feed a little bit more of your energy for the parts of your body language that is missing through the stream, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I, I guess a good like test for that is like how many YouTube videos have you watched of just like something that you're not, you're not necessarily like super interested in the thing that they're talking about, but just the person who's delivering it is just so interesting. Like I've watched so many like cooking tips and tricks videos right. that are just like people who are super engaging. Uh, just just because it's interesting to watch them. And so, yeah, letting your kind of personality bleed through into uh, into that video is yeah. super important. And I, just before we move on, I have one more tip on this uh, that helps. I'm doing it right now. If you can, record standing up. So right now, for those not seeing the video, I just bent down. I'm, I'm standing up and this flows the energy through my body and lets me move and knock the cable off my ears and all that stuff. But I found like being standing up gives you a little bit more energy. Most situations in life where you meet someone at a meetup or at a conference in the hallway, you're usually talking to a group of people while standing up and there's a little bit more interaction and energy. It's it's kind of rare to enter a situation where you meet new people and everyone sits down and mingles around. This is more like a work meeting or some like formal uh, scenario. So if you can stand up, you're usually a little bit more into that engaging, making new friends uh, scenario. Yeah, that is a super... Super good point. I hadn't actually thought about that. I'm currently sitting. I ah. should be standing. <laughs> Due to like how long it took us to get recording today, I'm glad that I wasn't standing. I feel sorry for you that your your legs are probably aching by this point after an hour and a half or so of, of getting ready to record. But uh, yeah, that is a very good, a good tip. I think I'll stand for our next episode for sure. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is um, preparing your screen for recording. Um, so you know, you need a good topic, you need something to talk about, but you don't want to lose your audience by either having uh, a low quality setup or just a lot of distractions on the screen. Um, so trying to remove those distractions as much as possible, getting rid of any of your desktop icons or your, your um, dock down the bottom, trying to make things full screen um, and, and zoomed in as much as possible so people can actually see uh, what, you're, what you're talking about. Um, so organizing desktops is a really good way um, to do this on, at least I use it on Mac OS, making things uh, full screen and then being able to swipe between full screen uh, windows so that you can kind of keep the focus on, uh, if we're talking about the writing the code section, then here's the code editor. If we're talking about uh, what this actually looks like in the browser or whatever, then we can see that in the browser window. 
Um, so trying to keep things as clean and organized as possible so you can kind of direct the focus of your audience. And something that I found really helps with that is creating a separate um, VS Code theme specifically yeah. for uh, for streaming or for uh, teaching. It's my teaching profile. Uh, and so I can load that up and it automatically uh, makes everything as minimal as I possibly can get it in VS Code. Um, it sets my font size to be readable. Um, it sets my contrast. So that's another uh, good thing to to make sure that you're using a high contrast um, theme in VS Code, uh, just so that your users will be able to um, be most likely to be able to read that, even if they're looking at it on a small screen. But yeah, I, I kind of bundle all those things up into uh, a VS Code theme, and then I don't need to think about it anymore. I can just, uh, rather than typing in like code space full stop to open up whatever project in VS Code, I type teach space full stop, and that opens it up in my teaching profile. Um, so that's something that I found super super helpful and convenient. Um, a really good resource to check out for this one um, is, again, we're mentioning Egghead again. I feel like uh, they're probably going to get mentioned quite a lot throughout this podcast because <laughs> I think we're both uh, quite big fans of Egghead. Uh, but yeah, the howtoegghead.com uh, resource is just amazing. It's this huge wiki of all of these, uh, like it's completely open, completely free. Um, it's even on GitHub if you want to add anything to it yourself or, or fix up a typo that you find. Um, but yeah, this basically steps through how to do screencasts, um, with that kind of egghead style in mind. And yeah, I've just found it invaluable in my, uh, in my, uh, journey learning how to do high quality screencasts. Yeah, it's an amazing resource. And uh, I found really, really cool. And that again, goes with the egghead philosophy that it's available to everyone. It's essentially a guide on the upcoming uh, instructors for Egghead, but it's open in public and the quality that's in there is, is just remarkable. I got a question for you. Did you say that you, from the terminal, you, instead of using code slash dot to open this file, you actually have, you use teach and it's going to open VS Code, but with a different uh, settings applied? Yeah, that's right. So wow. I've, yeah, I've created, so this is a, uh, I believe it's a um, an alias in terminal speak, whatever the uh, my ZSH config. Yeah. Um, and that opens up VS Code with that particular theme specified um, or with that code profile specified. Nice. Um, yeah. It's a super good way to just like set all those settings and then just completely forget about it. I see. I think uh, that I've seen that in Jason Langsdorf, who's a great content creator, he was sharing something. Uh, I think in a stream and he was sharing his config and there was there was a way to toggle between different uh, settings. My approach is <laughs> very old school. I'm going to update this. I usually go in settings and then comment out a bunch of, or like change, uh, I comment out some settings and comment in some settings that are under a like screencasting profile. And so I manually kind of change the settings every time. But I think, I think that's you the can... Kenzie Dodds model as well. I've seen Kenzie Dodds like at the start of a workshop, just like quickly commenting and uncommenting different sections of a gigantic ah, config. Makes makes me feel a bit better. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> I think you can point to different JSON settings that JSON file, and then uh, I should look into this. Uh, but well, yeah, to to circle back to what you said, I think it's very important when we're programming. We kind of like all these like heavy UI heavy things like autocomplete and suggestions and little tools and pop-ups and icons for GitHub, see how many changes there are and stuff. But when you're recording, every single little bit of UI is something that can take the attention away from the, the learner, even if they don't realize. And then they like start like scanning stuff and watching what time it is on your uh, on your menu bar. Or like more importantly, if you have like 7% battery left, they're gonna be triggered by this and just focus on that. So <laughs> anything that you can remove uh, from the UI, uh, that's why I like the Zen mode in VS Code. It just kind of removes a lot of stuff. And essentially, what in an ideal world, you have nothing else than just what you want people to focus on. There's a great YouTuber called Fireship. Uh, you probably know Fireship.io. The, the, the yeah. YouTuber kind of has like millions, at least one million and a bit followers. And everything you see on screen, most of the time, is literally two or three lines of code with a little emoji pointing at it in case it wasn't obvious enough. That's like super focused on nothing else than what you need to see. If there's more code before and after, he probably puts like lots of spaces before and after to just isolate the little bit of code. And this, this is a brilliant way to teach. Yeah, and I think like just the, the mouse cursor itself, like helping use that to direct your user's eyes. Like if you 
if you're <clears throat> if you have the cursor over in VS Code yep. and you have like a half panel of the browser and half panel of VS Code, uh, if you want people's attention to be directed across to a change that's happened in the browser, rather than leaving your cursor in VS Code, drag it across to the browser. So like you think of your cursor as like naturally directing your user's eyes because that's what will happen. Like if you move your cursor around, that's going to be very distracting. We're very uh, like primitive animals that if we see something move all of a sudden we're like is that a is that a threat do we need to do something and yeah. so our eyes just naturally track something that's moving um and so directing people towards the content that you want them to be focused on um is is really important yeah that's a very great point like the the little mouse cursor uh it has such an impact and use it when it makes sense and also try to train yourself i've struggled with this to not using like moving out to a different desktop and definitely not wiggle your mouse and circle and do do lots of stuff. Just like the the equivalent of if you're doing a conference talk and you're moving your hands and doing things that you're supposed to take a nice pose, which I can't do, by the way. <laughs> or if you're doing a podcast and you're throwing your arms around and ripping your headphones ripping the out, headphones exactly. <laughs> this is the exact uh, 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 illustration of the mouse like flicking around stuff and getting the the person watching you getting the headphones coming out. So yeah, like. Leave the mouse where it is. Also, if you do a, a cut transition, it's going to help if the mouse is in the same spot. Because if it's moved sometimes, again, it's not a big deal, but it might, someone might just pick that up and be like, oh, should I look down there? Because the mouse is down here and like get distracted. Little details that make a big difference. All Probably. right. Should we move on? That's, that was a great uh, segment. I really like all of this. Yeah. So the next one uh, is a favorite of mine, and it's optimizing for audio quality. Uh, you're making a screencast, a video, and uh, first of all, you can do screencasts without being on camera, and it's a great way to get started because there is about 80% less things to worry about, like lighting and what you wear and your haircut, or you just put a hat to hide your crazy long hair, which is what I do now. Um, <laughs> so, But even if you do a screencast uh, with video, I'm going to say something which is not even controversial anymore. Audio quality is more important than video quality. Like someone will likely watch your stream or screencast if you're on camera with a webcam from the your, your computer, which is kind of like 720p and not really great, but super mint audio. But if I'm using this DSLR camera and I'm switching to a crappy mic with lots of echo and lots of distortion, it's likely that people will not be able to enjoy it as much and might drop off. There's the studies showing that people just bail out if you below a certain threshold. And mm. um, and again, there's just that distraction. Like people are thinking about the bad quality audio. Like it's, it's just adding another thing that's rolling around in their brain instead of concentrating on the thing that you're trying to teach with your video. Yep. I've just knocked off the audio head buds again. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what I was going to say also... Um, very often people consume YouTube as an audio source. So they would put like a tutorial or something interesting. Of course, if it's like a deep dive in code, they need to watch the screen. But if it's a longer like, hey, watch me build like a replica of Netlify UI in like four hours. I know a lot of people that will put this in the background and then start doing the normal work and they still listen because you kind of, it's kind of like someone's uh, pair programming with you in the background. And so the audio is always going to be attached to the consumption in a way. It's very rare that someone puts a YouTube video and mutes it and just watches the, 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 the video. But in the reverse, there are a lot of people consuming just audio. A lot of podcasts, like ours actually, we, we're providing the video, but likely most people would consume just the audio. Although I have no idea about the stats, but just be prepared for that. So all this to say, uh, I think you should optimize for audio before for video. And um, the first thing that you can optimize is not necessarily the microphone, although it helps. And remember, we'll do another uh, episode where we go in specific gears and what John uses and what I use. But you can have a great mic if the room is poorly treated or untreated or just uh, randomly selected, you can have really, really bad results. And so I want to give you a few tips. I uh, actually wrote a, a blog post that goes in super deep details in that, so I'll share this in, in the show notes. But the one thing you want to try to remove in any room is the reverb or echo. And it's kind of like your voice bouncing off the wall, bouncing off the floor, bouncing off the ceiling, and coming back into the mic with a slight delay because it had to travel. And so it does that, that reverb that trails off and off. And it's nice in voices when you sing, 
Uh, it's nice applied to acoustic instruments, but techni technically in spoken words, you want the cleanest, driest signal possible. So, yeah, John, intentional what... reverb can sound very, very nice, but unintentional <laughs> reverb tends to, yeah, absolutely destroy your listening experience. Yeah, yeah, and that's yeah, it. I, I wanted to mention on your that um, the uh, the blog article that you did write on the better yes. dev screencasts uh, series. The thing that I really liked about that is that it's not just about like things that you can do if you have a ridiculously high paying job in tech, or things that you can do if you own your own house and have your own dedicated uh, room for for your your studio. Essentially, uh, the thing that I really liked about your article is that. Um, it, it lists a bunch of very cheap things that you can pick up really easily, but also things that you can actually install in a rental property. So if you don't own the house or the apartment or where, whatever, wherever you're uh, doing your recordings, there's some really good tips for how you can um, hang up some soundproofing and, and do different things to treat the room uh, without actually destroying the walls or, or, or losing your, your deposit on, on, the, uh, on your rental which I think is the exact situation you're in, Simon, right? Like you've got exactly what you were talking about in the video behind you. Uh, yes. Sorry, in the, in the yeah, cast, these, yeah, these blog posts uh, came from scratching my own itch. I live in a place that I'm renting. And in Australia, if you rent, you literally cannot do anything. You can't paint, change the colors. You can't put any nails because then, I mean, I grew up in Switzerland. You can just put holes in the wall. And as long as you fix it by yourself or get someone to fix it, it's fine. But in Australia, like you need to have like a an official registered uh, builder that can do the job. So what I needed to do to remove the echo is on the floor, very easy. Uh, put some carpet, some fluffy stuff. Like if you're interested in that, uh, read the blog post because I go in lots of details. But basically anything that is fabric and soft and cushy will absorb some of the echo. And instead of bouncing off in the mic, it will stay there. So on the floor, carpets is very easy. And then... It's the it's 11 in the morning, it's sunny outside, but it's pretty dark in here because I have this black background if you look behind me, if you're watching. If you're not, uh, what it is, because um, people think of sound treatment as really expensive. Like you can go for these sound panels, which is like a square of really high dense foam. Not just the little foam uh, thing, but the real panels and they're like multiple hundreds of dollars. And um, there's also sound blankets, which is the same concept, but in, in, in the shape of a blanket that you hang to a wall instead of a panel that you put like a picture frame. And what you see on the background, I'm just going to bend down and pick something up, is a moving blanket. Uh, so if you go to any uh, a truck rental where you can hire uh, moving trucks, they will also provide these little, I'm putting in front of the screen, these little blankets, which is just a typical really thick high density blanket. And these are taking you maybe 90%, 85, 90% of the way to a professional acoustic blanket. They're really heavy, they're sturdy. Think about it, it's to put, protect furniture from heavy stuff like scratching and colliding. So what I've done is I've used little hooks like this, M, 3M hooks, and you can't see it, but uh, it allows you to put it on the wall and then you can remove it without hopefully breaking the wall. Sometimes the paint comes off, but uh, this is another issue. <laughs> and what I've done is I've done almost every wall in my room. Uh, just there's that nice little background area where I wanted a bit of white, but I've put blankets everywhere I could. And if you can't do blankets, there's anything that is fluffy, like even wearing this thick hoodie right now helps. It absorbs some of my own echo. If you have a fluffy dog, let him in the office <laughs> and uh, yeah, just use your imagination. But uh, I thought it's pretty cool uh, to, to see the amount of quality improvement you can do by just adding fabric into your room. Uh, yeah, totally. And yeah, I think if you, if you like search specifically for like audio treatment stuff, that just adds like a huge premium to what you're going to pay for that, that thing. But if you like, you know, using something like moving blankets, Something that's just heavy um, material is just, yeah, such a, a cheaper, awesome way to do it. And you can kind of think about it like, um, like, because it's just vibrations moving through the air. Yep. Um, another thing that's similar to that is like water. If you were to pour water on the ground, anything that absorbs the water uh, is going to help absorb the sound. But anything that just like the water just sits on. So if you have like a tiled floor or something like that, if you pour water on that, it's not going to absorb um, and so you can think of that as that's not going to absorb those sound, uh, those sound waves. They're just going to bounce straight off that surface. So anything that would absorb point. water 
is a good thing to fill in your office. Unless like Simon, you end up with a water feature in your office, in which case you don't want the things that absorb water, but that's a different story for a different time. So the next thing that we want to talk about is just hitting record. And so, um, I mean, if you go back to the start of this video, you might even notice that like Simon and I are probably like a little bit more nervous at the start of the video than we are now. Like we're probably uh, seem a little bit more comfortable talking to each other. And that's because there is this like initial fear uh, and this adrenaline rush that you get when you first press record. Um, and you know that people are going to actually be watching this. Like we, we've been having natural conversation for like an hour and a half. But then as soon as we were going to hit record, all of a sudden, like it, it felt like there was this tense thing that we needed to do. Um, yep. And so this is very similar to like, if you're giving a speech in public, for example, like a talk that you've rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed. And then as soon as you go to stand up in front of people, you panic and you feel like you can't get the words out and you can't talk properly and uh, get very nervous. So this is supernatural. Uh, it happens to everyone. It even happened to us. And we basically record videos and do streams for a job full time. So, um, you know, I guess it's not, um, it's not super reassuring, but that's never going to go away <laughs> probably. Uh, but yeah, some tactics that you can use is just uh, trying to keep your breathing nice and slow. So that helps to, to calm you down. Um, something that we did with this, which helped somewhat, but maybe not perfectly was hitting record early. So, uh, rather than waiting until the point where you're saying, all right, we're good to go. Let's hit record. And then we'll, we'll just start the intro. Uh, we hit record maybe like half an hour or 15 minutes before we, uh, actually did the intro of the podcast. So we got, we got used to the fact that we were already being recorded. Um, you know, it, there's still, when you go to say the intro, you're still, you know, that you're, you're clicking into that mode of. Um, this is the bit that someone's actually going to see. It's happening now. But it, yeah, <laughs> but it can help to reduce that anxiety a little bit um, to to hit that first, get the countdown, get the red button flashing or whatever, and then hopefully cast it from your mind, feel a lot more natural about your situation, and then um, start your intro. For sure. Um, I just And something that... Yeah. Oh, sorry. I just want to make a quick comparison. It's, it's like you can't do that. You can't afford doing this. But if you could get on stage when you do a meetup talk, a conference talk, and just say to the organizer, hey, I'm, I'm going to walk on stage. You're going to announce me. And then I'm just going to chill for 15 minutes to kind of like forget that I'm on stage. And then when I, when I feel like it's, everything is normal, people are not eating me in the front rows, I, I can start talking. When you, when you walk on stage, be... you have an absolute panic attack. And to yeah. an extent, hitting record is kind of like stepping on stage. Someone just announced you and you're about to talk to an audience, even if you don't see it. So being able to delay that and just land back into your comfort zone before you go is great. Yeah, that's that's a really a really good technique. I wish that conference organizers would actually let you do that. Because, yeah, I feel like if you stood on stage, you started, like, talking to the people in the front row for a little bit, like, you know, feel feel like they're there supporting you on that journey rather than like, you know, just an audience that's, that's there. That's, yeah. um, yeah, it's a very good so way to a, do it. I guess it, comedians turn that around and start like heckling the front row or, or kind of like turn yeah. the spotlight on the front row, making fun of them. I feel like that's, yeah, it's a good tactic to, to break down, uh, that barrier. I was going to say, if you look at experienced professional public speakers, what they do is before the conference starts, they'll go in the room to the tables and introduce themselves and like break the ice with especially the front rows, because this is who you see when you get on stage. And they kind of intentionally create this like delayed uh, stress. They're like, OK, I'm going to introduce myself. Maybe if I'm introvert, it's still nerve wracking, but at least I've done this. And when I get on stage, these people kind of cheer for me because we've met and they're like, hey, let's go. He, that's the person we said hi before. So. Find any ways you can do this for your videos, like to kind of feel like you've already been on air before you go on air. Mm. Yeah, that's a good way to kind of like, uh, if you can, like in a, a live conference setting, if you can kind of like make the audience do something weird with you as well, that can, that can definitely help to, to break down those barriers. Um, Kenzie Dodds, I've seen in a bunch of his workshops, yep. uh, gets everyone to like stand up and do like exercises that you had Bob down and, Air uh, and, and <laughs> get the blood flowing and then introduce yourself to the person to the right of you, introduce the person to the left. Uh, and, and that kind of like breaks down that barrier and it makes people in the audience feel just as nervous as you feel on stage and uh, makes it a little bit more natural. I guess if you're doing a live stream, um, a good uh, example of that would be like asking the chat. If people are tuned in live while you're, while you're streaming, you can kind of pose a question to them or you can get them involved in the stream and maybe bring up some of the comments that they're saying and it can make it feel a little bit more like they're they're in that with you. So 
a little bit hard if you're doing um, like a, a separate YouTube tutorial or, or like a, um, a screencast or a video where you're, you're just recording by yourself. Um, but yeah, anything that you can do to kind of break down um, those walls is, is a good option. Uh, in line with that as well is um, rather than kind of trying to get the perfect take as your intro before you start recording properly, as in uh, rather than stopping and starting the recording every time you make a mistake, um, a good tactic to, to kind of reduce that overhead is to just leave the recording going. Like it's very easy to just edit the video, like regardless of whether you uh, nail the intro or not, there's probably going to be a point in the video where you're going to want to edit it. So at some point you're going to have to drag it into some editing software to make some, uh, some, some slices and clips. And so uh, by just letting the recording go, if you make a mistake, you can just stop, you can take a deep breath, maybe yep. take a sip of water, and then just start again. Um, and by doing that, it it means that like if you if you think about the amount of time it takes to stop the recording, delete that take, start a new recording, uh, and then go through that same anxiety of like the big red button is flashing and it's about to start. Uh, if you can get rid of all of that overhead and just leave the recording going, uh, it means you can probably get that recording uh, nailed a lot more quickly. And then editing is just as simple as like highlighting different sections and deleting the silence or deleting the mistakes. Um, so super easy to edit something, uh, much harder to, to nail the, uh, recording first time. So taking it like a sentence or a paragraph at a time is a good way to do it. Um, and then just redoing any, any sections that you're unhappy with until you're totally happy with it. Yeah, totally. And I think from a editing perspective as well, if you end up with like 300 clips, it's not necessarily easier to edit them and like, Hey, cool. I already have my cuts so I can, I can chunk them. Uh, from experience, uh, having a two-hour recording and then I can quickly figure out it's usually the last time you say the same thing that you want to keep. So you can recognize the audio form of a sentence after a while and you kind of uh, fast track to the last one. You can even do a hand clap or some sort of signal to, to tell yourself, hey, this is the one I want to keep. Uh, cut it off, cut the rest. Uh, and I think it's important you say that because I don't know about you, John, but sometimes it takes me literally hours, two hours of raw recording for maybe a five minute on camera segment. And I feel like this is not something that's talked about enough. There's the assumption that us content creators uh, nail the thing in one take. And to be perfectly honest, there are people that can do this. I know some people that can just hit record and record a 30 minute on camera thing and gold pours out and it's a one take nail like home run. I am not one of these persons at all. Uh, especially the first set couple of sentences where I'm like, I've switched to recording mode, Simon, and I'm like, I've set up the cameras and everything. And the stress level makes that the first sentence sometimes takes like half an hour just to say, hi, let's start, the, let's cover this. So if you just yeah. get over it and just, hey, people do this, I'm just going to hit record and uh, until 5 p.m. if I need to, I will just record whatever I need and then I'll chop it up. It, it kind of frees you. But I think it's important to reveal to the public that uh, most people struggle with that, especially the opening segment, and uh, it's not a one-take thing most of the time. Yeah, absolutely. I am I am much the same. I actually had a, uh, a promotion that I did for a, a Level Up Tutorials that I a course that I recorded recently. Um, and in that, I showed like a behind the scenes of my editing setup. And it was a one and a half minute video that I currently had over an hour of takes to um, yeah. to, to chop up into a very small segment. So uh, yeah, don't don't think that because we do this again, we do this every day and we we constantly are um, are doing these video tutorials. Uh, it's it it is definitely not one take, and we definitely have hours and hours and hours of footage uh, that we have <laughs> thrown away. Um, and yeah, so this this idea of not stopping the recording can really help speed up that process for um, sure. and yeah. yeah, allow you to just quickly throw away the bits that you don't actually care about and, and not have that initial stress and adrenaline rush every single time you try and hit record to nail that take again. Uh, John Linquist from Egghead again, uh, actually has a really <laughs> great short course, uh, on Egghead, um, which I believe is a, a free community resource. So even if you don't have a pro Egghead account, I believe this is available to everyone, uh, where you can, um, yeah, learn some really, really good tips about how to uh, record screencasts in this way and how to use, uh, in that example, he uses ScreenFlow. You can kind of apply those same techniques to other uh, pieces of editing software. But yeah, would highly recommend that. I'll make sure that it's in the show notes again. Yeah. This podcast is unknowingly sponsored by Egghead. 
<laughs> <laughs> they didn't yeah. even know. They didn't even have to send us money. Yeah, they don't. They didn't no, even no one. Uh, I, it's it's actually funny, but I think only John and I know uh, that we're recording this thing uh, right now. Maybe uh, J- uh, John talked to his people, and I talked to my people, but. Uh, it's it's unannounced and we're recording the first episode now and it feels like we already have a sponsor, but we do not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, next topic I want to cover, we kind of talked about it, but I want to give some pragmatic tips is how to overcome your fears. Because by now it's obvious that there's some level of stress and fear coming with recording uh, screencasts. Uh, first of all, identifying the fears. Most of the time, uh, public speaking, uh, being in front of an audience aside, it's like there's that fear of not providing value. Uh, for me, it was pretty strong. Like I used to be a school teacher, a primary school teacher, and then I pivoted to web development, uh, which we might do an episode on the whole journey that led us where we are. But uh, I've always had that uh, thought that there's people that know so much more about the topics that I'm teaching than I actually am. And I'm the person presenting them. So I'm like, I might not, someone is going to see through me and just uh, realize that I just know the surface stuff and then poke holes at it. And it's quite common. I mean, imposter syndrome is a thing, but even if it's true, even if you do know less uh, than other people, there's still ways to provide value. And it's important to listen to, to these tips because it kind of helps you uh, get over your fear. So a few tips that I can give you from my personal experience. I'm not a doctor or a psychologist, but I can tell you what worked for me. And from my short career, uh, I've, I've proven to work with other people because of the feedback they gave me. The first thing I do uh, usually, um, if someone wants to get started, but they always find reasons to procrastinate and say, oh, I need to change my lighting, or I need a better microphone, or I need to choose between Riverside and Ecamm Live. <laughs> <laughs> this is a this is an inside joke because we have actually pushed the recording from a week because we were like kind of finding unintentionally finding ways to like oh maybe we do it next week. This sort I think of this st- is actually our third week attempting to <laughs> to record, and so yeah, once again these these things don't go away. I think we should have probably read through the 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 content for this episode to help us prepare the podcast. Yes, because uh, yeah, basically we we ignored every single one of these suggestions. Yep. I said to John, we, we're just going to record and we don't care what tool we use. We don't care about building a, a, a backlog. We just record and publish. And then we've done exactly, not exactly the opposite, but we've we've found ways to like, oh, maybe just one more week would let us like do little details and stuff. So my tip is to do what I call a little Hello World mini video. Whatever you're going to teach, uh, share your screen and do like a 10 second segment. It can be anything. It can be how to Uh, add some padding to a button in CSS. It can be camera on you and say, hey, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going to start doing these tutorials on YouTube because I want to become a better teacher. I want to share what I learn and just learn from others from the community or just give back to the community I've learned so much from. I promise you, and I have uh, backing examples for this. If you, right now, when you hear this, uh, take your phone out and do a 10 second video of what I just said and you publish it on your social media or whatever you use, uh, people will encourage you to keep going. And without realizing, you will go over that first uh, fear barrier that's very, very strong. The, the initial one is probably the hardest to get over. Um, by doing this, you're like, okay, I've uh, maybe gone through the process of creating a YouTube account and I've uploaded a video. I've learned how the tool works if I wasn't using it before. Now I've got this thing out and I'm not dead. <laughs> thing went okay. <laughs> I feel pretty good because I, I've got experience some success. And most likely you will have some positive comments. It's very rare that you do this and someone just drags you like, oh my God, I can't believe you want to do YouTube videos. Why would you do this? You will have uh, overwhelmingly positive feedback, hopefully, and it's up to you to focus on what feedback you take in and what you should decide to ignore. Because unfortunately on the internet, there's always going to be some negative stuff. But yeah, the, the negative stuff tends to come later when you're actually successful, though, and people want to, like, cut you down. Generally, True. if you do put up, like, a, a Hello World style video of, like, this is something that I want to do, people will generally support you and, and be there along with the journey. And that, yeah, it helps so much more feeling not only like you have the support of all these people, but now you've actually said you're going to do something. So so there are other people that are going to kind of hold you accountable, uh, or at least in your head, 
you'll think that they're holding you accountable to doing this thing. So yeah, always talk about the thing that you're going to do because uh, it, it kind of helps with the the marketing of the thing. Like if, you, if you're thinking of creating a video on a particular topic and then you see there's a bunch of people that are interested in you creating that that video, then you've got people to go back to as well. And you've got people to say, hey, I, I did make this video live. And then hopefully we'll be able to kind of bump those views up uh, a little bit quicker because uh, you already have people that are keen to see that thing. Yeah, that's a good point. It's uh, us developers in general are not very good with the whole marketing sales and we tend to want to build something in, I don't want to generalize, but you build something in complete darkness and then you publish and then you tweet, hey, I've built this thing. And you would have likely have so much more momentum if you share Then people say, hey, I think that's a great idea, but maybe try this. Uh, and the same can be applied to screencasting. Like you can say, I want to do a course on TypeScript, on React, on Tailwind CSS, on anything. Uh, you might find that there's your specific audience or contacts at the point you are in your career are interested in more narrow thing and you can help model what is going to work for you and also what makes you interested. Uh, the other point I wanted to share um, that helps a lot and it helped me, even if I always don't do, I don't always do the videos on this uh, approach, but is to switch your mindset from an educator to documenting where you're at in your journey. And that's huge. Uh, and shout out to Gary Vaynerchuk, uh, who hammered this message in my brain. Uh, he always says documents don't create. And the idea is to, instead of thinking, how can I create value uh, to a level where I'm not an expert, like I need to do all this research before I can record a simple video, uh, you can just say, just uh, put all your cards on the deck and say, hey, I'm a beginner. I'm going to learn TypeScript. I don't know what the heck I'm doing with it, but this is going to give you a fun journey. I'll make some videos on my progress. You can come on the ride with me. And I guarantee you doing this, people will relate because many of us, me included, are completely newbies to TypeScript and they're like, oh my God, this person just announced that they don't know what they're doing, but they're going to learn. So I might learn along the way with them. And this is also a great shield if you're worried about people dragging you and saying, well, actually, this is not how you do this because you've disclaimed from the start, I'm learning, I'm not the expert, I'm just going to learn and share what I learn. And I think this yeah, is super useful to put you in the mindset of, I'm just sharing where I'm at in the journey. Yeah, it gives you gives you that kind of thing that you can, yeah, you can always point back to it. If someone says, well, why didn't you talk about this thing? You can say, yeah, totally, I am... At this point in my journey, that's a really good point. There's something that I can go and, and learn on top of this. And so it gives you that that kind of excuse not to know everything. But it also uh, hopefully makes it a lot easier for people to to join in with you and, and again, create like a little bit of a community that's going along uh, learning that thing together. Yeah, and if your fear is to not provide value, uh, sharing your personal experience absolutely does provide a ton of value because there's always going to be people that are exactly where you're at or just one level ahead and they remember, oh crap, I, this exactly happened to me or one level below and they can see what's coming next. And uh, yeah, just documenting your own learnings provides extreme amounts of value. Yeah, because just documenting the facts about something, like the documentation for the thing is already there. Like if you want to learn about how to do a particular thing in Tailwind, you can go and look at the documentation and, and get that like factual way that you do it. But what's missing is that that journey from A to B, like you're at this point, you understand these things and then you're getting to this point. Um, yeah, that's that's something that is super, super valuable. Nice. Um, so yeah, I think that's everything that we wanted to go through with the actual like content of this episode. Uh, as I mentioned at the start, um, we wanted to kind of flip the the traditional kind of, um, the, the traditional uh, structure of a podcast on its head and kind of provide the the value of of this stuff up front. So try and jump into the episode as quickly as possible. So if people just care about the the value of of what we're talking about, then you know you can just quit now. You can leave now and go and go and do something else. Uh, and then add a little bit more about the like kind of personal side and the the less serious part at the end. Uh, and you know it would probably help because now we'll be warmed up and and you know feel a little bit more comfortable with uh, talking about. Uh, ourselves and just just casual conversation it'll probably flow a little bit easier so uh yeah first thing is what we're working on at the moment so uh yeah what what sorts of things do we want to plug and talk about um 
I wanted to talk about a blog that I wrote for um, a Netlify marketing campaign that came out for uh, something they call Matter Day. Uh, and so if you head over to matterday.netlify.com, uh, you can see this awesome uh, landing page that was uh, designed and built by Lynn Fisher from Netlify. She did a yeah, kick-ass job. Um, nice. And yeah, I, I basically built the Superbase backend that powers this. She built the beautifully designed, nice uh, actual app that you use. Um, and so I wrote a, a blog about how I um, built that Superbase backend and the, the sort of uh, problems that I ran into and how I solved them. And then I also did a live stream, which went catastrophically wrong. <laughs> uh, I think it's the the worst, <clears throat> like stream I've ever done in that uh, it just, it went uh, as poorly as it could go. I did 20 minutes or almost 20 minutes of the stream completely muted and had no idea. And so I was like <laughs> presenting like how I built this thing uh, and had gone through like so much content uh, and got to the 20 minute mark. And thankfully someone from Superbase where I work uh, was watching the stream and uh, was able to to jump in and, uh, and tell me that I had been muted because uh, yeah, I had the I had the wrong window up. I couldn't see the chat because I was just like trying to jump into this topic as quickly as possible. Basically, made every mistake that you could make, and didn't have ever anyone there to tell me that uh that I had made that mistake. So now that's why I'm bringing on you know Simon to do this. Uh, so I always have someone who's checking my tech <laughs> before I before I actually jump into it. Um, but yeah, the rest of the stream was awesome. So I recommend you go. I've chopped off the <clears> first <throat> seventeen and a half minutes or whatever. Uh, off that stream now. So we'll have a link again in the show notes. Um, go and check it out. It's a, uh, yeah, super cool. Uh, yeah, we, we basically built the entire Superbase backend uh, during that stream, even losing the first 18 minutes to, to tech problems. Um, and then also just wanted to give a shout out to a weekly live stream that I've been doing um, again with other people so that they can tell me when I've messed things up, uh, which is called the Superbase Happy Hour. And so that's going to be... Uh, I think we're about to move the time, so maybe I shouldn't say what time it is now, but every Friday, <laughs> uh, basically we, we stream for a couple of hours building, um, some kind of fun app that might use Superbase, it might not. Um, but I recommend you check that out. And we've just wrapped our first example application where we built a multi-platform app. Um, so something where you can use, um, Next.js and Flutter, uh, but tie into the same Superbase backend. So basically build one backend that can serve multiple platforms. Nice. But yeah, check out the link in the show notes, Superbase Happy Hour, <coughs> happening weekly, just like this podcast will be from now on. Let's hope. <laughs> now we're going to do this. Yeah, this is great. Uh, I'll share what I'm working on myself at the moment. So I am working part-time, as I said at the start, at a company called ThinkMill, which is uh, doing uh, design systems and a lot of work with big uh, clients in Australia. It's kind of like an agency, but the word agency doesn't apply. It's It's I like to think of it as a collective of really, really smart engineers and designers that understand how to work without silos, and it's, it's a great place to work. So that used to be my full-time job. Uh, then I went to, to Tailwind Labs, and right now I went back 50% at ThinkMill, and the other part of my week, I'm working on my own uh, course on Tailwind CSS. So this is uh, an independent course. I'm teaming up with the unofficial sponsor of this podcast, which is the team behind <laughs> Egghead. Joel Hooks and friends, and uh, if you've uh, consumed Epic React or some of these big courses, uh, Kenzie uh, did. It's the same team behind uh, the product, so the team helps with all the the marketing, the sales, the production, the email course ramp up, like all the things you need to do. Like I mentioned before, developers don't think of this until it's time to launch. Uh, I'm working on the course right now, and in parallel, they're doing a tremendous work building up the the hype and. Uh, like preparing stuff for when it's ready to launch. Uh, so I'm working on that. Uh, I'm and this is for that really one. excited. And yeah. <clears throat> like, um, like, like John mentioned at the start, we wanted to be able to just have a casual conversation. But if you're not interested, you can tune out. And we just going to have a segment uh, because the, the podcast is called The Nav Bar. Uh, this uh, open discussion is called Open Bar. And I have a specific sound for it ready. So, oh, so good. <laughs> whenever you hear that sound, uh, we're technically not going to talk about the topic of the day at all. We might talk about tech because we're just nerds. But uh, I wanted us to have an opportunity to just speak about who we are, just what's happening in our lives. 
I'm going to start with this uh, right now uh, is basketball frenzy in my life because uh, there's a season that started in January of this year and right now is towards the end. So I'm coaching my son's basketball team and last Tuesday we won the championship, which is pretty cool. That's awesome. Um, my daughter plays in another team that I don't coach because it happens usually in parallel at the exact same time. So I can uh, coach and watch from the other court. Uh, they went you to, need the to get your wife to to coach that team, so it's well, like you you've got one each and you compete. <laughs> yeah, my wife is actually heavily involved in all basketball stuff as well, more as an admin manager, because uh, we also handle the the reps team, which is like the representatives of uh, Sydney region. So it's kind of like a selection of uh, the better, best players from different region. And my son made that team, so we both like co managers of I this. I wonder so that... how your son made the team. <laughs> both of his parents were involved, and somehow he made it. No, I'm joking. I'm yeah, sure well, my well, my, I mean, my wife is a, a ex triathlete, like at the pro level, and uh, we both teachers. And I love basketball, and she loves running. And turns out, if you run a lot and play basketball a lot, it it kind of it kind of meshes nicely. Um, yeah. So yeah, we, we awesome. have all yeah, these. It really is like a whole whole family thing. You've got everyone involved in basketball. That's yeah, awesome. that, basketball is my true passion uh, outside. Like I love tech. I love making videos. I love the web. But if I I think if I could. Uh, not worry about money or anything or working for the rest of my life. I'd probably start like a basketball training program for kids and coaching. And to an extent, I already do this uh, as a side hobby and I love this. And tonight is my turn, is my grand final. So our team has uh, beat the other semi-final team last week. And tonight at 8.30 p.m., we're playing the grand final. Uh, I don't want to make any commitment now because we. <laughs> I am 41 years old and we have a bunch of 40 plus in the team and the, the other team is probably in their late teens and they're all reps players that, like my son, but uh, my son is nine and they're 18. <laughs> right. So we shall see how we go. I, I, I'm happy to play whatever happens. I'm going to shoot a lot of threes because that's what I do. I'm a great shooter. I, I slow down the rest of my game, but I can still shoot. Uh, and hopefully next week I can report something fun. Yeah, I was bas- just going to bas- say, by the time this goes live, that will be determined. You will have either lost or won. And so, yeah. Uh, we can edit, I, I hope we can edit my <laughs> segments in a way that makes more sense, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, yeah, edit that's out been, the part where you said uh, you were going to win. Uh, outside of work, in my personal life, uh, basketball has taken a very strong uh, dominance in the last couple of weeks. So that's me. What's happening in your life? Yeah, also lots of basketball. I wish I was playing more basketball. I I started playing basketball just before the pandemic. For the first time in my life, I've been a basketball fan for ages, but started playing and then, you know, COVID stuff happened, lockdowns happened. I think I played two games and then it was like, yep, no more, no more uh, team sports. Uh, You're all in lockdown. So uh, yeah, didn't, didn't get much practice. And then I was like, all right, as soon as I'm allowed to, to get back to it, I'll, I'll keep playing. And then they did open up again. And in the second game back, I rolled my ankle in oh, a no. very bad way ah. uh, and was like, um, yeah, I, I like couldn't walk at all for like six weeks. Uh, yeah. I had to stay entirely off it. Um, and then obviously it was still very, very weak. Uh, it's probably back at the point where I, I could start playing now. So I would like to go back, but it turns out when you have... Uh, even one child. I have two two children now, but at the time only had one child, and it is extremely difficult uh, parenting when you can't stand up or lift anybody or, or do anything like that. So yep. I feel like the stakes the stakes just continue to get higher and higher uh, as yep. you as you progress on in your life for those injuries. Um, but I am a huge basketball fan uh, and a big fan of the Celtics, who unfortunately just lost the <laughs> NBA Finals. So this might be like. <laughs> Yeah, this probably won't go out for another week, so this might be well and truly old news by then. But yeah, Celtics lost to the Golden State Warriors, um, but it was a very, very fun season to be a Celtics fan. Yeah, it was. Um, they have a promising future. The young, core, yeah. bright, bright team, and I like that they all have been drafted. It's like both Golden State and Boston are like these teams that have been assembled over time, ra- rather than just like handpicking a bunch of superstars and making a super team and then trying to do that with another team the next year. So yeah, yeah, uh, totally. bright future for the Celtics for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think this was something we, we talked about uh, off stream was that, yeah, I started supporting Celtics like right 
as they were, I think the last time they either made the conference finals or NBA finals. And that was the first year that I supported them. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. I get to watch my team win all the time. And then like the very next season, like <laughs> the the two star players retired, they retired the jerseys. And then they basically just brought in heaps of of young rebuild uh, mode. Yep. Rookies and and yeah, and basically just rebuilt the team from scratch. Uh and so I had to watch for like, you know, eight years or whatever as they just like slowly get used to to playing together and working together. But now the team is awesome. Um, we've probably lost every single person who's not a basketball fan by this point. But uh, <laughs> another thing that I've been really enjoying recently is that um, there is a new Game of Thrones show coming in, I think, August, which is like set in... Um, a slightly different time. I don't want to go into it if you're not a big Game of Thrones fan, but uh, I really, really disliked, as probably the rest of the world, the ending of uh, of, of the actual Game of Thrones show. Um, but I, I feel like that had tainted my whole idea of Game of Thrones. And so going back and watching it again from scratch in preparation for the new show uh, coming out has been really, really fun. That show was awesome up until the point where it got really, really bad at the end. Have you watched any <laughs> Game of Thrones? So, um, uh, I watched the first season like a while ago and I, I gotta admit, I'm not, my, uh, our family is not really spending a lot of time watching series or movies or stuff. I think we kind of opted to do taking turns in making activities. So I go play basketball or she goes running and the other one kind of minds the kids. And, uh, I do consume a lot of content, uh, but instead like we used to watch a series together. It's always more fun if you like watch together but then we realized we don't have enough uh evenings <laughs> where we both yeah. home and so it takes forever <laughs> sure. and we kind of kind of tune out so i haven't watched game of thrones for a long time uh, but i do consume a lot of youtube content uh it, when your job is making youtube videos you start to look at other content creators but that's like the work approach like and analyze what works what's interesting but then when i want to relax i do watch a lot of basketball and uh one thing that is my highlight of every single uh, weekend uh, YouTube-wise, not life-wise, is a guy uh, called Harry Mack. So I don't know if you into hip-hop and freestyle raps. Uh, I'm going to say something very controversial. It sounds controversial. Harry Mack is by far the best freestyle rapper ever, and it's not even close. Like, wow. that, that this is a claim. Yeah, there's Eminem. There's so many people that there's are absolutely Nat, insane. All of the people, yeah. I promise you, cool. and... Uh, this is going to rough some feathers, but if you go watch the, the shit that Harry Max does. So he started before COVID and he was like in Venice Beach in LA and he would just like rap to what he sees. So he saw some, the, the first video that went viral. There's a, a guy with a bicycle and red pants that stops and he started just rapping about his pants and more and more people come around and he just like calls out everything he sees. And he was at a level that's like, holy crap, this guy is amazing. And if you look at what he's doing now, like two years later, he's got now 2 million subscribers on YouTube. And uh, he, when COVID came, everyone was like, oh, uh, that's that's it, I guess. You can't do freestyle in the street. And he took it to Omegle, Omegle, I think it's called. It's one of these apps that connects you to random strangers. Like you, you can't select who you're talking to. You just, I've never tried it actually, but I think you, you click, yeah, right. uh, talk to someone and it just randomizes someone appears from anywhere in the world. And so there's a lot of weird stuff happening, like some dodgy people. But <laughs> wh whenever someone doesn't skip, uh, he says, hey, uh, do you want me to do a freestyle? Give me three random words, whatever you want to think about. And they come with three words. And then you, they, they think, oh, yeah, he's that white guy, wh white guy, bearded, gray hair. Like, he's probably going to be really whack. And not only does he rap with the three words, but each word is a complete scheme. Like for one minute, he goes into this absolutely crazy uh, puns and word patterns. And he's incredible. Like what I said at the start, I maintain it. And the more uh, influential rappers discover him, uh, I guarantee everyone is like, holy crap, this is the best by far I've ever seen. And I don't know if, if, you, if you're in the hip hop circles, there's a, there's a, a show called Sway in the Morning. Uh, it's kind of like co-produced by Eminem and Sway. Uh, it's called something about the morning show. And everyone for years, like basically that show, they invite someone and then they do the, the thing called the five fingers of death where he throws five words and they have to freestyle. And everyone for now a year were like, dude, you need to get Harry Mack. He will absolutely destroy the five fingers of death. And before they're invited, they have to do this little challenge that he did like a couple of weeks ago. So if you look, I forgot how it's called, but if you search Harry Mack, 
you will find the Sway uh, freestyle stuff. And you can hear, you, you can't see Sway or anyone. It's just, uh, it kind of feel like a Zoom thing, but they're here in the room, but you just see Harry Mack. And you can hear at the end Sway, which is usually, you can tell by his laugh or his reaction if he was like, hey, that was good, or, or holy shit, this was amazing. And what you hear at the end is like completely blown away. So that means that awesome. he's, he's probably going to be, Harry's probably going to be invited on that show. And that usually puts people from... Uh, not mainstream to like absolutely mainstream uh, hip hop. Yeah, but wow. he's amazing. Check yeah, him out. I've, yeah, I think I've only seen the 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 first and maybe the follow up video, like both at, at Venice Beach, um, kind of like yeah, like a busker almost, like he just kind of or like yeah. a street performer where he just starts doing something and then just like starts bringing a crowd and like a bigger and bigger crowd start circling around him because he's just doing awesome stuff. But yeah, I haven't checked out any of that live. Yeah, he streams. started that and then he went into this like zoom like video call and it's it's almost more poignant because it's one person and it's like a, a three four minute clip and there's a lot of people that are like depressed or really sad or one person just lost his uh his girlfriend who was a mother of a really uh, young child she died of covid and he like at the start he's kind of drunk and fat and he said like oh everyone on this app says i'm fat and they just tease me and stuff and then he lifts him up to a, before knowing that his partner passed away he just lift him up and the guy said, oh, can you, can you rap about my wife? She passed away. And this moment, like I get emotional just talking about this. He, the, the transcendent emotion that he can provide to someone through freestyle rap is just incredible. You got to check awesome. that out. I'll put that yeah, link to absolutely. that video in the show notes. Yeah, I will definitely check that out. Uh, that, I think, is an awesome place to end it. So thank you so much for tuning in for our very first episode of The Navba. Uh, we are planning to stream the unedited vision, uh, the unedited version of the video live on YouTube each week. Um, so we actually need to create a Navba YouTube account that we're allowed <laughs> to stream from, and then uh, we'll get that up and up and going. So definitely come and hit subscribe in the link, which will probably be in the show notes. Uh, come smash and hit subscribe like and hit button. that. <laughs> smash that like button. Hit us up with a comment. Uh, click that little bell icon so you get notified when we're going live. But yeah, if you want to come watch the unedited version where we look very, very nervous at the start and uh, and probably make some more mistakes throughout, then definitely come and come and watch that with us and keep us company. Uh, but otherwise, we are going to have the nicely edited version uh, that you can just listen to audio only in your podcast uh, podcatcher of choice. Uh, once again, my name is John Myers. You can find me over at John Myers underscore IO on Twitter. And I'm Simon Swiss and I'm at Simon Swiss on most things, but mostly Twitter is the way to catch up with me. Uh, so yeah, I hope you liked the episode. And if you did, uh, when it comes out, let your friends know about it. Uh, do all the things that kind of help us uh, commit more. If if there's people that subscribe to this thing and we're like, oh, we we may as well continue now uh yeah just just looking forward to start this journey with you i think uh for our first episode we did pretty good i was definitely nervous at the start and then things get better and then a little nerve comes in and then it just goes back and i think we'll just get better and better and we're looking forward to see you hear you next week whenever you hear this which is not next week but the next week in our lives yeah awesome so it's now <laughs> your responsibility if you want us to keep doing this you have to go and tell your friends about it and make us, you know, uh, inspire us to keep going. Uh, but yeah, no, thanks heaps for listening slash watching slash however you consumed this. And we will see you again next week. Have Bye. a great week. See you next week. Bye-bye. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah.